Hello, and welcome to the Science and the Five R's 2.0 presentation. Thank you so much for choosing my presentation today. If you chose my virtual presentation at MFPE last year, this will be a new and improved version. I've learned and uh, over the past year and have some new insights and also have an additional R. So if you've chosen my presentation once again this year, thank you so much, and I hope you'll get something new, new resources, new insights. I'm Jennifer Statham, and I'm from the Montana Office of Public Instruction and the Indian Education for All Implementation Specialist in the Indian Education for All Unit. So again, thank you so much. And uh, please do reach out to me if you have any questions at all. The best way to reach me is at jstadum.gov. Email is always the best way to reach me. And then we can set up an appointment from there. I also have new office hours uh, this year. So you can check all that information out on our website. I do have my website in the resources, which I will share in a few slides. I would like to begin with a land acknowledgement. I am grateful to feel connected to a landscape that has been used consistently for millennia before my arrival by multiple tribal peoples, including the Salish, the Blackfeet, the Kootenai, and other tribal nations, Crow, Northern Cheyenne, Chippewa Cree, Nez Pierce, Nakoda, Dakota, Little Shell, Assiniboine, Shoshone, past, present, and future. And I am presenting today from Helena, Montana. I would also like to acknowledge my relationships and uh, the knowledges that have been transferred and shared with me over the years by these many amazing people. You may recognize some of them. There's Shane Doyle and Robin Wall Kimmerer, who wrote Breeding Sweetgrass. There's Dr. Daniel Wildcat, Marissa Spang, uh, the Blessed Tony Incashola, may his memory be for blessing, Tim Ryan, Henrietta Mann, Mandy Smoker Broadus, Julie Kajun. Uh, oh, Tim Ryan's in there again. We presented, that's in the, the lower left corner where we presented at the National Indian Education Association Conference years ago, and my Indigenous science team who really helped to grow me and inform me in this whole process. And that's Frank Finley and Tim Ryan, Marissa Spang, Amy Williams, Melody Small, Leo Bird, Carolyn Pardini, and Molly Iverson. I am so grateful for my relationships these many have mentored me, supported, loved, encouraged, and provided me with their friendship and invaluable guidance. Each has taught me the sacredness of the gift of knowledge and has, has asked me to both carry and teach what has been shared in a responsible and respectful way. And I do hope to model proper respect and, at, and attribution giving as I share knowledges and information um, that these folks and many other sources um, have become uh, part of my, of my teachings. So grateful. So we will cover the five R's, what the five R's each are, and basic guidance. We'll talk about the indigenous knowledges in relationship to each R, and I will also provide connections and resources for each R. So we'll begin with the five R's. And I would like uh, to just say that all of these pictures are mine. <laughs> and I give you full permission to use um, each of them. Um, there's a bit of root, there's uh, morels that were in my garden this year, which was uh, miraculous. Uh, a mom and a baby bison. I took that photo in Yellowstone on Mother's Day years ago. Um, you know, the change in seasons and that cracking of the ice over our water and um, a hoverfly, which is a beautiful, fuzzy little pollinator um, on, on a, like we believe that's a zinnia. So we're talking about today, respect, relationships, reciprocity, relevance, and responsibility. 
And some of these themes are really repetitive, and that's because all of this truly is related. And um, the more we can see these connections, and the more we open our minds to finding these connections as we teach various concepts within science, I truly believe that will create more pathways to accept more worldviews. And the more we have worldviews we have at the table with some of the complex problems facing our society and the even more complex solutions that are needed, um, it gives me great hope to think that um, this messaging and, and these strategies will be carried forward. So respect, you know, we're thinking about establishing a sense of respect within yourself, with students, tribal members, with all the living things found on a landscape, and with your students, and of course with relationships, with all the same things, with yourself, with others, with the land, with the living things, with your students. Reciprocity, I would really like to make the point that reciprocity is not transactional. It's not like going to the store, buying a loaf of bread for $3, or maybe it's $5 today, and uh, handing over $5. That's transactional. Reciprocity really comes from a much deeper deeper place, and it's, it's um, really recognizing and participating a cycle in which of energy in which you are participating. And so there's a giving forward and there is a taking, but there is also um, uh, that acknowledgement that's that's steeped into the, the reciprocity and that gratitude that's steeped into the reciprocity process. So reciprocating when anything of value is shared with you, whether that's wisdom, medicine, knowledge, a story, time, space. If you are in a mindset to um, acknowledge that, you know, you are giving me your energy by paying attention to my words today, and I have have put the words and the knowledges together with all of the energy from the people who have taught me. So seeing reciprocity as a part of a cycle and steeped with gratitude, I think is um, essential to understanding how this fits in. And of course, relevance, um, nothing means more to a learner than having knowledge and concepts made relevant to them. But it is also ensuring that indigenous knowledge is valued and that curriculum have culturally appropriate outcomes and assessments, um, asking students uh, to, to reflect on what has been taught to them. And we can go back to reciprocity, relationships and respect, and asking students to you know, find connections to the value of what they they've learned, particularly if it's tribally specific information. And of course, connecting science and traditional ecological knowledge. If you see tech in this presentation, it does stand for traditional, traditional ecological knowledge. Um, two students lived experience and connecting concept experiences, explorations, and reason, regionally specific data um, and information to a local landscape. And of course, responsibility. Um, towards self, towards others, towards information, towards the land and the foods and, and medicines that come from the land, and of course, responsibility for attributing where knowledge and information comes from. Respect. I would like to frame the respect in the traditional knowledges of the honorable harvest. And the honorable harvest is a term that was coined by Robin Wall Kimmerer. And it is uh, featured in both breeding sweetgrass as well as breeding sweetgrass for young adults. If you haven't read either of those, I strongly recommend them. If you've ever been to any of my presentations before, you know that I always bring up um, my dear friend, Robin Walkimer. She's pretty fantastic and I feel just so grateful. But these principles, I, I just love them. And I think, you know, as we endeavor into incorporating tribal knowledges and, uh, you know, tribal landscapes into our science curriculum, having the honorable harvest in mind and having these principles in mind and teaching them to students, I think is really important. Share. We start that in kindergarten, right? Be grateful. Reciprocate the gift. Never take the first, because if you take the first, it may take energy away from the plant. The plant may think it, that it's threatened, and so it may not produce as much. So never take the first. Ask permission. 
you know, just asking permission, hey, can I harvest this berry? Is this okay with you? And connecting with that plant may sound far-fetched to some of you, but I promise if you try it, um, it it's just part of that, that reciprocal relationship and, and it's a respectful relationship to ask permission if you can harvest something. Listen for the answer. Take only what you need because other animals and other critters and the ecosystem may need um, what is left on the plant. Um, and I'm just using a plant, uh, plants and for a harvest, but of course we also harvest bison and deer and elk and waterfowl um, across Montana. Uh, minimize harm, you know, be, be aware of the surroundings that you're in and, um, you know, not, not uh, degrading it in any way. And use everything you take. Don't take more than you need. So these are some basic principles of respect and how this may look like in the curriculum. Um, I would like to share some different recess resources with you. And these are all, they happen to come from uh, this Good Grub organization, which is really fantastic. So this is just one example. And I would like to share uh, this video with you. I think it captures a lot. And oops, here we go. Welcome to the Native Foods and members who are interested in learning about plants and sharing plant knowledge in our Pacific Northwest tribal communities and beyond. The portal includes the Cedar Box Teaching Toolkit, the 10 Gather Grow Curriculum, the Native Infusions Curriculum, the Plant Teachings for Growing Social Emotional Skills Toolkit, and the 13 Moons Curriculum. The educational resources you will find here are rooted in Northwest Native knowledge and traditions and reflect many years worth of work and collaborations among some incredible plant teachers. We share them with you as we acknowledge that this knowledge stands on the shoulders of generations of teachers. To learn these teachings is both a gift and a responsibility to our ancestors, to our tribal communities, and to the land. We ask that you review the 10 Gather Grow Teacher Guide and the Honoring Plants, Places, and Cultural Traditions video before you use the materials. In developing these resources, we held the intention to increase the knowledge and skill of teachers and students in identifying, respectfully harvesting, using, and caring for our native plants, animals, and cultural ecosystems. We also hope that these resources will help build a greater sense of community both among humans and with our non-human relatives, as well as a stronger connection to the seasons and to local places. For teachers, these resources encourage culturally responsive teaching or embracing multiple perspectives with the learning community and inviting both students and community members to share their ways of learning and knowing, such as through storytelling. The overarching outcome we hope to achieve is building resilience. That is, feeling empowered, strong, and able to adapt just as the plants teach us. Again, please keep in mind that in our indigenous communities, knowledge is shared as a gift. This gift must be honored and shared with respect and in the manner it was gifted. Thank you. Haishka. The fun of virtual, right? Making sure we are all on the same page as we are presenting. Oops. Okay. And here we go. There's, that won't be the first mess up. 
All right. So within that um, that good grub uh, uh, introduction, and asking you to film, watch the the small film first, and you know, I love how she talks about how the information has been gathered for over time, and um, they ask to for respect with the curriculum. So these three links here, um, they're included in the resources, and they will take you to the uh, main good grub tend gather grow curriculum page and give you all kinds of information and access to the teacher guide and then if you want to use the rest of the curriculum this is the access um, site so you'll you'll actually fill out a little questionnaire and um, it just uh, I, I really like th these layers actually because it instills a sense of respect and it instills the um, the value of reciprocity and relationships as well so I wanted to share those with you in um in regards to respect. And the next R will cover is relationships. And I'd like to think about this within the traditional ecological uh, context of ecosystem. So from the sun to the tree, to the mushroom, to the soil, to the pine, everything is related. So when we're teaching anything about systems, we can think about these relationships and we can teach about the relationships with a focus on that rather than the objects within the system. And that's just one way of conveying the indigenous worldview in such a gorgeous way. I think um, I'm kind of partial. So when we talk about ecosystems and we talk about relationships, you know, often we use the words commensalism, mutualism, symbiosis, and parasitism. And here is a resource that I would love to share with you. And um, it is from the Montana PBS Learning Media. And again, some of these resources are not Montana tribe specific, but the way that they're created and the way that they um, they implement indigenous knowledges with Western science is so powerful. And uh, they also are aligned with uh, many content standards that align with Montana content standards. So I just wanted to broaden some horizons and provide you with some really excellent uh, examples of culturally responsive curriculum. So again, this is uh, from Montana PBS Learning Media, and there is a small uh, video that talks about symbiotic relationships, uh, particularly in the Klamath River Basin with the Yurik and the Karuk tribes and their relationship with the salmon. And um, this is just a little example. This is activity one from setting the stage. And again, um, I will be sharing the link Thanks to this presentation. So you can actually access this presentation itself through uh, Google Drive and you'll be able to access the links. But I do also have a resource page with all of these links so you can explore them um, on your own. But let's see how this screen share goes. Let's select new share and hopefully this will be seamless for you. Let's see, doesn't look like it went to, here we go, new share. Okay, so here is the film. Let's see how this goes. We won't watch all of it. I'll just show you a portion. We feel like the salmon is related to us. We feel like the condor is related to us. Every little species is related to us and it's our place culturally and ceremonially to protect them. We would not be Yurok without this place. This place has shaped us and to some extent we've helped shape this place. The river is a teacher in itself. We have a symbiotic relationship ecologically as well as culturally. We can learn all these great life principles, but that is nothing without reciprocating that responsibility and that relationship with the creatures of the Klamath River. Most indigenous people of this basin feel that, you know, the Klamath River really is like the lifeblood of our culture and since time immemorial we've lived off this river and this river has provided for us and not just in the form of fish but in the form of a lot of different things and many of our religious ceremonies revolve around species that the river supports as long as we are here 
there has to be salmon. I could not imagine not having any salmon. It's a, it's our way of life. It brings us together, it provides healthy food, happiness, sadness, uh, great occasions. We're almost ready. A little bit of sea salt, not too heavy, but. So as you can see, very much from the indigenous uh, perspective and um, sharing some culture and traditions, but also sharing the science of symbiotic relationships. And if you look over here on the right hand side, there is uh, access to all of the activities that are a part of this tending nature symbiotic relationships uh, unit. So um, personally, I find that very exciting and I hope that you do too. So next we have reciprocity. And I wanted to frame this within uh, nutrient cycling. And so looking from the berries to the grouse, to the grass, to the bison, and how um, each contributes to the next step and, and each uh, is dependent on each other for the next step. So similar to the relationships, however, uh, we'll go to the next slide here. Um, I think as we as we look at reciprocity from the indigenous perspective, um, we're including, again, uh, when I talked about reciprocity not being transactional um, earlier, it includes gratitude and acknowledgement, acknowledgement for the transference of energy in a nutrient cycle. That's practicing reciprocity, and it's an essentially po essential part, excuse me, of understanding a system that sustains you. So here I have a Montana Harvest of the Month a lesson, a bison lesson. Uh, there's also an article that is about the Great Falls Public School Bison Harvest that they participate in, their Indigenous um, Studies Department, and um, the their students there participate in this every year, and it's become very powerful. And um, there's also a, a short video, again, that I would like to, to share with you that is about re reciprocity from the uh, Indigenous point of view. There are other films available that you can um, share freely with your class. And so again, as we kind of look at um, this cycle, and I'm pointing to my little graphic here of um, you know a grassland ecosystem or a bison ecosystem, um, it is healthiest when bison are on the landscape. So not only do the bison, you know, with their hooves being an ungulate, a hooved animal, that disturbs or their hooves digging into the ground helps to till the soil so the soil doesn't become compact. They contribute their feces. So bison pies are incredibly nutrient dense, nitrogen dense, and help fertilize the soil. Uh, the worms help to aerate the soil. The birds eat the worms. And um, then, you know, we eat the, the bison and the bison bones and all of the, the bison waste products after most of the bison would, would historically be used, um, goes back into the soil and the fungus help to decompose it and the worms help to aerate the soil and decompose. And so we have this beautiful reciprocity, but if we take away the bison, we find that grasslands, and this was actually part of my one of my master's degrees um, um, research, was looking at uh, how multiple animals use a, a landscape, particularly long-billed curlews and sandhill cranes in grazed wet meadow habitat at Red Rock Lakes National Wildlife Refuge. If you ever need to cure your insomnia, you can look up my article and. <laughs> I promise you it's not that exciting, but it was very interesting for me to think about how removing an, um, a major ungulate, a keystone species from a habitat changes how all the rest of the species use that habitat. So, you know, looking at Western science and then through the lens of uh, reciprocity from the indigenous perspective, um, everything has to contribute to another but I'm gonna try sharing uh, this a bit of this little film here to keep you interested. Let's see, I need a new share and we're going to select this. And if we scroll down a bit, there we go.
Whether we're aware of it or not, we are part of nature. We are interconnected with all beings, every level. Indigenous communities across the world are so diverse. But this idea of being in relationship with the land, being in balance, taking care of one another, this value of, of reciprocity is something that connects Indigenous communities. Stories from Indigenous peoples about being in reciprocity with the earth since time immemorial are essential in delivering messages of truth, of healing, of transformative change. We asked the Reciprocity Project filmmakers, what does reciprocity mean to you? We're here as guests. We're here to be as careful and as responsible as we can be. When we started Reciprocity Project, we knew first and foremost we wanted the films to serve Indigenous communities and resonate with folks who may not be Indigenous, but who care about the environment, who care about the earth, who want to truly address climate change. This is our main spring that gives us water. So that just gives you a little taste, again, um, reinforcing the concepts of reciprocity and um, um, from a different perspective. Uh, uh, I really love, uh, I won't op open this article right now because there's other things that I wish to share with you in the time that we have left. Um, but this, again, this link is uh, will be both in a uh, Google document as, as well as um, in, in the presentation itself that will be part of a Google document. And, um, it's just a, it, it, uh, I really love how Mr. Coburn, Dugan Coburn, who is the director of the um, the Indian education program at Great Falls, and he um, really does, he talks about the reciprocity and the respect and the relationships, and it's, it's really a, a beautiful context for everything that we are talking about today. Relevance. So I think um, in the traditional ecological sense of, you know, like the changing of the seasons and how, you know, there are transmission of knowledges, meaning that um, there is knowledge outside of yourself and either through a person or an experience or, you know, an amalgamation of, of all the things, um, you, you receive that knowledge and integrate it and it becomes a part of you and it changes your perspective or expands your perspective or expands your knowledge base. So I really love thinking about um, relevance in education because it it Montana kids have such a connection to place. Um, you know, hunting and gathering is is a part of all of our our cultures. Preparing for winter <laughs> in Montana is a part of all of our cultures. There's certain things we do, whether it's you know making sure we have snow studs on our car or proper snow tires or that our snow shovel is out and ready to go or that we go and harvest huckleberries or choke cherries or raspberries and we freeze them or make them or preserve them and put them up for winter there's many many ways um, that um, across all of our cultures that we prepare for winter. Um, but when we think about, you know, relevance from the Indigenous perspective, connections to place, to self, to lived experiences, um, this makes all of learning, it makes teaching uh, relevant and, and more exciting. So the more we can use place-based, tribally-centered podcasts and lessons, um, I, I'm sharing a few of these podcasts here. These are from Montana Public Radio, and they are both Aspen Decker. And if you love what you hear he right here, um, connect with Humanities Montana because Aspen is available uh, to come to your classrooms through Humanities Montana and present um, storytelling. And she and her husband Cameron do this. So I highly recommend if you are if you like what you see here, um, look her up again. Humanities Montana Aspen Decker. 
And uh, this is the Salish seasonal round. And so when you think about, you know, what is relevant to um, your students, what is, but what is also relevant from the indigenous perspective, if we start with the seasons, uh, all Montana kids know that there are four seasons. There's really not um, a place in, in Montana where we get to escape from winter. Um, and our summers are seemingly changing um, a little bit, at least I can tell so from my, my gardening experiences in the past few years. Um, but winter, when it comes upon us, our days are short and dark and, um, and very cold. So um, I, I also within that though, that I would like to make a point of is that within winter, when you think of these tribal people, not just existing, not just, you know, surviving on this landscape, but thriving through a millennia of winters, having to learn how to waterproof their clothing and their materials and their shelters and having to keep fire sacred and, and keep the fires going and having access, knowing where to camp, to have access to fresh flowing water throughout the winter. Um, these all took an enormous amount of intelligence and wherewithal and perseverance to figure out and then that knowledge transmission, sharing it with the future generations so they can continue to thrive on this incredible landscape that we have here that, quite frankly, um, I'm very appreciative for being able to flick a switch and on comes the light and turn a knob and on comes the heat. And so uh, I'm not sure how well I would personally survive in the winter um, having to actually go into survival mode. So when you think of the technologies and the intelligences employed, again, for millennia, thousands of years across this landscape, um, it's pretty remarkable. And that's a wonderful thing to be sharing with your students. And so then when we come um, into in the months, um, we we see that uh, these are the, the Salish names, the English translations of the Salish names for the months, so handshaking month, coldest month, month of geese, buttercup month, etc. And then where they would be camped um, is the next dinner circle and the main activities uh, during those times, what they would be hunting, whether it's a bison hunt or deer, elk and fowl. And then inside of that, the fishing practices and, and when, when those would be appropriate. And then in the very inner circle is the activities that would take place. And they and it all makes sense um, when you think about what goes into cordage plants. Why are cordage plants in the fall? Well, if you go to harvest dog bane, which um, has very straight long stalks, you peel the outer bark off and inside is this stringy material. If you go to harvest them in the springtime, it will be flourishing and thriving and bringing in all of that photosynthesis and that chlorophyll will actually make those um, cellular walls incredibly dense and thick and very hard to turn into cordage. So if you wait until the plant stops its photosynthetic process, synthetic process, then when you open the dry plant up, you will be able to easily strip out the dried car, the dried cordage, and that's what you would begin making your cordage out of. And when you think of, you know, how important cordage is, it's, you know, to tie your moccasins, to tie your bundles, to help with constructing your lodge. Cordage is used for so many things as well as sinew cordage as well from, from the animal itself. But uh, the plant cordage was also incredibly important. So, you know, that knowledge of when to harvest it, incredibly important. So let me share a little bit uh, with you from uh, Aspen's uh, bitterroot so you could just get a taste of it. It's time for Field Notes, brought to you by the Montana Natural History Center. My earliest memory of speckum bitterroot was when I was 12, on a warm spring day in Kadlanitwe, Camas Prairie, where I sat with a group of elderly Salish women visiting and cleaning the skin off the roots of the bitterroot plants. The women never left any inner pink skin on the root. It was always cleaned white. 
they would pop out the heart of the speck of the bitterroot and set it in a pile of peelings that were to be reburied. It was a smooth technique achieved by digging their nails into the skin just deep enough that the peel would gracefully slip off the roots. While we clean the root, I listened to them reminisce on old stories told with our Indian humor. The day was full of laughter and joy connecting to our culture. I could listen to Aspen all day, uh, but that was just to give you a little taste of um, her podcasts. And again, those links are right here. They'll be available in the resources Google Docs so you can listen to them in full. Each one is about six minutes. So all of these uh, video and audio resources that I am sharing with you, they are uh, are very short and very accessible for your, your students. So, um, but talk about making it relevant. You know, here, this is a uh, Salish story um, told by a, a young tribal member and she, uh, uh, you know, perfectly executes uh, her language, her heritage language of Salish. And what a wonderful opportunity to bring that relevance, you know, into your classroom if you're talking about plants or whatnot. The next podcast is regarding um, culturally modified trees. So that is where the cambium is peeled off, the outer bark is peeled off of the, the tree and the cambium layer that that. Um, very thin layer that's that is next to the xylem and the phloem within a tree. Um, it, she talks about how the, those trees are marked, and you can see them on the landscape. And, um, you know, often it'll be a rectangle and some of them will be very, very old, especially if you've gone way deep into the Bob Marshall wilderness, you may have seen culturally scarred trees and those trees are, are very, very old and those scars are very, very old and they tell a story about how the people used uh, the trees. And finally, um, this last link is to a lesson. And let's see, here we go. Um, so this is a this is actually a unit, and what is on your screen right now is lesson three. And um, yes, it is for grades three through five, but there's a lot in here. So whether you want to build your background knowledge about seasonal rounds or just want to take a look at you know an, a really beautifully integrated science lesson, these, by the way, were developed in partnership with OPI and the Montana Natural History Museum, who um, helped publish those field notes that Aspen participates in. Um, anyhow, these lessons, they have, uh, this is Earth and Space Science, and so it has the uh, content standard. It has the essential understanding connections, learning objectives, background information and resources, procedure, class discussion. So these are all available on our OPI website and um, are incredibly relevant and um, incredibly place-based and uh, tribally specific. So they're wonderful resources and a great example for you. Let's go back to the presentation for you for uh, relevance. And finally, responsibility. Um, I really love thinking about responsibility in terms of the traditional ecological knowledge of, you know, sustainability. Never take the first, never take the last, take only what you need. You know, those are responsible things, but they also contribute to sustainability, which is a, a huge concept when you, again, think of multiple thousands of people living on a landscape for multiple thousands of years and nourishing that landscape and not degrading it to the point where they could, it could not sustain them. So um, very important concepts when you think of um, a culture being on a landscape, developing their lang language on the landscape, um, developing all of their knowledges on one particular landscape for thousands and thousands of years. So within 
these, um, I'm I'm looking at the, these uh, resources and connections in two ways. So um, number one, let's just think about taking some personal responsibility. You know, please learn more about Montana's tribes. We have so many resources available to you. We have so many virtual recorded webinars that you can have access to. And when you watch any of those webinars, if you did not attend the live one, you can watch the recording they're in the uh, both the playlist description as well as the video description. There is a link to a survey. And if you complete the survey, you get professional development units for watching the recording on your own time. So I strongly recommend um, exploring all of our resources. If you need help with that, please reach out to me again. J Statum, J S T A D U M at mt.gov. And I am happy to help you out in any way that I can. Um, learn more about Montana's tribes. Learn more about the deep history of the landscape you are on. Participate in tribal functions. Go to powwows. It's okay. Be brave. Um, go to a powwow. Go to a game night. Uh, sometimes you'll see that tribes advertise, you know, it's a public game night. Go and see what it's about. Learn about rock and fist. Learn about uh, stick in hand and the stick game, etc. Or go to a feast. Um, you know, again, these things, if they are open to the public, they are advertised. Um, most of the tribes have Facebook sites and they put this information on there and, you know, engage with the culture. We have a tremendous opportunity here in Montana to engage with multiple cultures. And I can just promise you and guarantee you from my own experiences um, from the past 14, almost 15 years of working in Montana with the tribes, it's one of the best experiences that I have ever had in my life and what helps bring so much joy and passion to my work um, because of all that I have learned and um, all that I have gained from participating with tribal functions. Um, model appreciation for knowledge that was shared with you and uh, practice taking the time to consider indigenous perspectives, narratives, data, practices, et cetera, that come from different worldviews other than your own. Practice finding and acknowledging con connections between place, people, and concepts. That, that's all expressions of responsibility. We do have a few specific resources for a better understanding. Um, so first, I would like to start with the um, infusion matrix. There we are. So um, in this, I uh, so far have only have one for grades K through five, but it is my intention to work on a middle school matrix as well as a high school matrix. Uh, but this gives you a good idea of what I am aiming to share with you. So we begin, um, this is four grades, not grade banded, but four specifically grades one, K one, two, three, four, five. I talk about the DCI for each grade. And I'll go back to the kindergarten here so you can see two at once. I talk about which standard and there is a link to the standard. I talk about the Indian Education for All connection. So here it's natural resources gleaned from the landscape and not for, uh, for not just survival, but for thriving. And here's an essential question if essential questions help you in your curriculum planning. If humans cannot go to a store and buy something already made and in a package, what exists in nature that humans could use every day to help them survive? Have tactile exploration stations, especially for kindergartners, right? Where, there, where stones can be used as tools, hopefully not with each other. I trust you to set those guidelines, but stones can be used as tool, water can be used to wash things, dead wood can be used to build things like shelter, uh, fresh water and tools can uh, to make work easier, being the concepts at each station. And then I include a story, how the buffalo was used. So you can click on this link and, um, and access that story. So that's what I have tried to do. Sometimes I have tribally specific resources. Uh, sometimes I have lessons. So those are all available to you as well. Now, another document and I am hoping that it is, let me make sure that it is. There we go. Uh, let me make sure it's sharing there. Yes, it is. Okay. 
This coming to know, these are frequently asked questions on Indian education for all and science content integration. Um, so, you know, what, what is Native American traditional indigenous science? What is traditional ecological knowledge? Does integrating science meet Montana science content uh, standards? Integrating indigenous science, excuse me. And so I include our science standards that actually include Indian education for all. And there are, and there are are more. Um, is this uh, assessed? Will it fit in with what I'm expected to teach at my school district? So check this document out. I think it can be um, very useful for you. And finally, we have our uh, building background knowledge. What is indigenous science and why does it matter in the science classroom? And I had the wonderful Marissa Spang. I don't remember, I don't know if you remember me mentioning her while I had my expressed my gratitude for relationships, but she's featured there a few times. She's a high school teacher in Lame Deer, and she discusses her perspective on teaching science and integrating Indigenous science in the classroom. She is both uh, Crow and Northern Cheyenne, so she brings a lot of her heritage, especially her relationship with her great aunt, Alma Snell. So if you've seen A Taste of Heritage, the book A Taste of Heritage by Alma Hogan Snell, um, she is a relative of Marissa's and Marissa learned a lot of ethnobotany um, through that lineage. So anyhow, Marissa does a beautiful job um, just talking about what Indigenous science is and why it matters in the classroom. So these three documents are available to you on our website and or through this Google document. And um, so that's a great way to practice responsibility within uh, Indian education for all and indigenous knowledge and, and incorporating that into your science curriculum in a responsible way. So finally, it's all related. Practicing and engaging in respect, relationships, reciprocity, relevance, and responsibility in no way diminishes the teaching of science. It simply opens the door to consider a more connected way to incorporate other worldviews. Imagine what solutions our students can create with even more compassionate tools in their scientific toolboxes. Aho. Here are the resources featured in the presentation. Oops, sorry about that. Um, finally figured out how to use my mouse during this presentation to advance slides, yay. Um, anyhow, all of these, again, will be available in a Google document, which should be available in your conference resources. And finally, Lem Lunch, which is Salish for thank you, or Toda Raba, which in my language is uh, Hebrew and uh, is thank you as well. Again, I'm Jennifer Statham. You could reach me and you'll have to leave a message if you call 444-0725, but let me know the best time to reach you. That rings actually directly to my computer, but I will get the voicemail message and I will call you back from my cell phone and um, or reach out through my email, jstatham at mt.gov. And finally, if you aren't aware of our Indian Education for All Tuesdays, our first Tuesdays, every Tuesday, September through June. Now it's October, but you're not too late. You can jump in in November. Um, the first Tuesday, November through June, we will have Energize, which is an Indian Education for All monthly gathering. We will have games, prizes, and uh, there'll be a connection to the essential understandings, a mini lesson to be modeled for you, and some incentives uh, with bigger prizes uh, to help you get fully integrated across the content using the essential understandings, but it'll also be a place where we can provide updates on professional development and new resources that we've developed uh, and, and other useful information as you endeavor to integrate Indian education for all in no matter what content area you are teaching. I thank you so much for choosing my presentation today, and I wish you a wonderful rest of your conference. Please reach out anytime should you have any further questions. Thank you.